or my point of bringing this topic up to the, you know, for the listeners is there isn't really any right or wrong. There's, there's the fact that you should be able to justify the yeah. sequence that you have your exercises. In. And if you can justify them, then, then there you go. That's great. If you can't, and it's just entirely random, look for the reasons and think more deeply into why you have the sequence you do, because you may be able to optimize that, that workout based on the sequence of the exercises better than you are. What's up, guys? Welcome back to Blood, Sweat, and Gear. Of course, I'm here with coaches Skip Hill and Andrew Barry. Skip's got like 20 years experience. Andrew's at 14 years experience coaching. I'm just behind him. So we are here today, guys, to help you do better at this sport that we love and, and try not to make a lot of the mistakes we made in the process, you know, the mistakes we see people make. Uh, all of our programming is brought to you by truenutrition.com. You can use our code THINK for some additional savings, high quality supplements. Hit me up if you want to talk to me about flavors, anything like that. If you're in Canada, check out supplementsource.ca. Lots of great deals over there. And thank you to everybody who is supporting our programming over on Patreon. You guys are awesome. I've been trying to put up some bonus features over there. So if you're on Patreon, make sure you, 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 you log in once in a while and check that out. Uh, today... We're gonna get, we're gonna get a, got a topic. We're gonna talk about uh, picking our exercises, exercise sequence, why we put the exercises where we put them. Um, Andrew, then, which I'm really excited for this, uh, he has a, a story for us about his terrible weekend traveling with his wife for bodybuilding. I have no idea, but I have these pictures on my phone. I'm supposed to be sharing with you guys about the hotel room and stuff. Uh, and then we're gonna take some listener questions. So anyway. What's going on, guys? Oh, and congratulations to you, Skip, for uh, another uh, uh, another first call out finish with uh, Manny Rodriguez. That was fucking awesome. Man. Yeah, very cool. Appreciate that. Yeah. We're looking forward to the next uh, couple shows. I do want to say to Matthew Sharp, my client, um, my just to make you feel like an asshole, because <laughs> I know it'll get him. This this is a Christmas coffee cup, but the reason I use it is twofold. Number number one, it's very very large, so I can put a couple cups in it. But number two, it was given to my wife um, when her grandmother died, passed away about nine years ago, and since then, my wife has kept it, and she rarely uses it. And when I use it, I'm supposed to be very very careful with it because it has such a kind of a nostalgic yeah. and sentimental yeah, yeah thing so so um the coffee cup does suck matthew thanks i appreciate that <laughs> all right well I'm glad, we anyway. that in. I'm glad we got that important stuff out of the way before we mm -hmm. got into bodybuilding um exactly so where do we want to start with this skip we're talking about exercise sequence we're talking about <clears throat> Um, why it is, and it's going to be an individual thing. What have we learned over the years and, and what have we learned from others um, as far as where we place our exercises? I want to let you lead this thing up. Yeah, I just kind of think sometimes the basic or rudimentary things that go into our own training, we just assume that everybody else does. Like something like exercise sequence, like, you know, why for triceps do you, do you open with you know, this particular exercise, maybe not even specific exercise, but this type of an exercise and then go into this type of exercise followed by this type of exercise. So there very few people are very few people who have trained for a long time are entirely random. It yeah. may seem like things are changed in rep tempos and rep ranges and exercises. But even when I speak for myself, even when I change an exercise, there's still these parameters that I'm staying in, whether consciously or subconsciously. And there's a fine balance between you want to change things to create a different stimulus, but at the same time, you know the things that work for you and you know the things that may cause a situation or a workout to become more risky, I guess, is a good, not, and it's not just about risk. I don't bring this topic up just for risk, but for efficiency and optimization and things like that. And I think there are people that just don't even think they just kind of randomly, well, fuck it today. I'll do this or that. And there's nothing wrong with that. When I was younger, I could, I could randomly throw shit around and exercises and it's no big deal. But I think my point is just that there is a method to the madness with things that seem so basic like sequence. So I wondered what you guys did to kind of contrast against what I do with my, and, and we could give some examples and maybe those, you know, people think, no, oh, okay, well, I don't give that a much, you know, that much thought, or maybe even I'm, I'm overthinking it and I'm being too rigid with what I'm doing. Hmm. 
All right. So who's starting? <clears throat> well, let me Andrew brought up the this, idea of going with we've... which muscle group. It's almost like grab one. Like, it, you know, <laughs> it doesn't matter really. Well, what well let me ask you this, though, because this actually pertains to that, you know, like which muscle group are we talking about? And I know we've talked about it once or twice before. Do you guys train, say, your back differently than you train your chest versus how you train your legs in terms of rep execution, uh, rep ranges, uh, volume of exercises, all, all that stuff? That's my question to you. I think it's a good way to kick it off, honestly. That's a good question. It was something we just talked about with Dusty. Dusty obviously does, right? He's got the yeah. much higher rep, much more control on his leg training, and then more ballistic, crazy stuff with back just all out. So where are you at with that, Skip? I know I do. I'll use an example. You know, Speaking of Dusty, this is a pretty good you know, legs being one. Even before my injuries, my legs can't handle the volume that – say back or shoulders can handle huh. i can literally fucking destroy my and be crippled sore in like half the volume of four legs or specifically i guess for quads if we're talking then i can for other I, I mean crippled like if i tried to keep the volume and the intensity that i would normally have on you know i guess my intensity level that i want to maintain crippled sore and that will have me overtrained in fuck four weeks and when I say overtrained, not just, you know, I'm not talking really even aches and pains, but progression just goes, it literally goes in the toilet. I run out of gas. I'll find myself halfway through a set of legs and just like all the, you know, that feeling of fatigue where you're going along and you're like, oh, this, oh, this is smooth. And then they just, one rep just starts to crawl They're done, and yeah. you're like, and maybe you can get three more, but you're, it's crawling and you're like, could could my body just get to failure because this is horrible? Like I can get another rep. I don't want to get another fucking rep. Yeah. I just fail for Christ's sake. So there isn't much. Uh, I'm being long winded about it, but the point is, is that's a good example there of something that is different. Explosive movements versus, um, you know, some some muscle groups may be more, I call it stretch and feel or stretch and squeeze. Yeah. So I know I do. Tra I don't train them radically different. Like I'm not going to do high intensity drop sets and stuff like that for, for a muscle, for one muscle group versus another. I'm, I don't have this dramatic contrast, but there are changes. I am really animated today. And I think it's because I'm drinking all this coffee. It's good. We, people like you that way, Skip. <laughs> they do. You got that. That's a big ass cup too. It's like a damn right. It? It's a huge cup of coffee. <laughs> All right. Well, if if nobody's going to put it on the table, I, I, I'm going to say this: that um, you know, going back to like 2008, 2000, 2008, uh, looking at the message board and reading what John Meadows had to say, I started looking at the principles of Mountain Dog at that time, and it made a lot of sense to me to. First, find an exercise that I could use to kind of warm up all the tissues, basically getting like getting blood flow, getting good activation and and kind of that first exercise allows me to kind of feel like what's going on in my body. And then from there, picking something where I can I'm, I'm warmed up now and I can work into that heavy meat and potatoes. And people hear me say that term. I know a lot of people use it, but like if you're my client, I say meat and potatoes like anytime we're talking about training, like every time that term comes out, meat and potatoes get into that heavy meat and potato stuff. So if it were back, I would probably get into a row after a pull down. If it were chest, I would probably get into my dumbbell incline press after doing a fly, you know, something where I can get that muscle warmed up, then go into something that is going to be like really central nervous system taxing something where I can, this is the, this is the movement where we are going to grow. And then after that, my next exercise I'm picking something where I'm not as concerned about pushing that heavy weight, but I still want to challenge myself. Now I'm using more control though. And now I'm, um, I'm really making sure that I can, I can finish that ex finish that muscle off. So maybe I go to a machine where I don't have to stabilize anymore. And then from there, finally, final component would be some type of a stretch or sometimes that yeah. stretch would be combined with that third exercise. And then from there I'm, I'm good. That's that's the way I would personally if I had to like just sum it all up, I learned that from John's really early stuff. And then I've just kind of I've kept that in the back of my head because it's made so much sense and it's kept me from getting hurt. And then I've applied that to all my workouts since really, honestly. 
The only thing I'll say, John would differ on the first exercise. Like he would never do a stretch exercise first. No, I wouldn't either. You get what I'm saying? Well, you said you did the flies first. Oh, okay. Yeah, I guess I would. I, but you know what, though? I'm not focusing on the stretch as much as the fact that, um, like, a, okay, like a pack deck would be my ideal my ideal. Yeah, or movement. a cable fly. What about a cable fly? I like that at so, the end more. Yeah. I, I, so I like, really? well, okay. let me give you the breakdown. Let, okay. let me give you the breakdown on like a chest training for like a mountain dog workout, right? Yeah. Because you're, you're, you're pretty much right about all of it. But so the first exercise is going to be that pre proprioception activation exercise. And it's going to be typically something like an incline dumbbell press, a barbell press, or sorry, uh, incline or, or flat dumbbell press. Okay. The whole idea here, very rarely are you ever seeing guys tearing pecs doing a dumbbell exercise, right? Just because Absolutely. of the different range of motion, how you can twist your wrists, et cetera. Yeah. So, and, and you're going to go heavy on that. Like you're probably going to work up to a top set of eight, somewhere in that range, sometimes a backed off set. And then the second exercise is going to be like your high threshold motor unit stuff where you're going to be doing speed, like an incline barbell press sets of six to eight, almost as fast as you can under control. And then your third exercise is typically typically going to be um, something that's really just going to pump you up. So the weight isn't the overall factor there. It's like you're going to use a cluster set technique or rest pause or drop set or some other type of technique that's just going to like drive not just mechanical tension, but also metabolic failure too. Yeah. And then finally, the fourth exercise is going to be your stretching exercise. When, when the muscles is loaded with blood as it possibly can be, then you're going to lengthen and stretch, and stretch everything back out with a fly or a cable or something of that nature. So, right on. And that's actually not my favorite way to train, to tell you the truth. And um, that, let me say too, though, I, I do want to point out when I say that, like I said, it's it's not that I I'm trying to do what John did as much as gotcha. it was my interpretation in 2008. And at the time, like then later, I actually did like real mountain dog and um, and it was different. Like my like my interpretation was different than what he did. But I had that in the back of my head. And that's what I've employed ever since. You know what I mean? That's what my thought mm -hmm. process is. Part of it is a little bit different because part of that for me is also going to be like the pre fatigue. I feel like pre fatigue in chest particularly works really well for me. I like, I like that. So that's, and, and I don't focus as much on the stretch in that first pec deck movement. That's I'll stop how I am as well. Will you? Okay. But then at the yeah. end, if I'm going to do it, then I will like, like a, I might even mm -hmm. do like a like a DC type dumbbell stretch, like dumbbell fly type stretch at the end yep. of the workout, you know. Would you guys agree that doing going right into like a chest exercise, going into like a stretching exercise, like a dumbbell fly or an incline dumbbell fly might be on a more dangerous end of the scale? No question. I wouldn't want no to. Question. I yeah. do. Yeah. Right? Like yeah. If, and if you you're can gonna get away with it. Yeah. Yeah, you can get away with it. But as far as now, if you're going into that first exercise and it's more of a stretch and feel and you're staying higher reps and you have no, like, you're not looking for progression and really banging the shit out of the set, then I guess maybe I'm not fucking with that. But I will open with cable yeah, yeah, flies, yeah. but I don't exaggerate the stretch in yeah. a cable. They're not short. No one would look at them and go, mm, those suck. Those aren't very good. But it's not an exaggerated, I call it open or really wide, um, you know. Uh, range of motions. Most, most cable flies only allow you kind of to do more of like a like a like a like a press fly combo. Really, if you think about it, you know what I mean. The new ones, it's very rare. That's why I go the, old school with the wide ones. Hmm. Basically, oh, the gotta, old okay. here. Here's the thing. I use the tricep press down machines that everybody uses instead of the cable cross. I always find this is funny. <laughs> On those lap pull, you know, systems and everything, you have the cable cross in the middle, you got the tricep extent. No one uses a tricep press down on the end. They have to do it with the double pulley because the stack is so much bigger. It's heavy. And I can only it's use heavy. Four God damn right, there's it's heavy. There's only there's only two pulleys instead yeah. of the six that are on the other one yeah. to allow you to pull it up with <laughs> 20 plates. Exactly. <laughs> But I don't like those narrow machines that they have these days that are set up specific. I understand why they're there and they're good because people tend to only do cable cross or do basically isolateral at the same time. So then I get even more irritated when people go to that and they do single arm tricep press downs and shit. Because, and this is why, it's not, I don't give a fuck about whether you need more weight on the stack, but what you, what it does over time is it creates drag on one side versus the other. <laughs> it does. It, and especially in yeah. gyms where they're not maintained. So that's another yeah. reason that I carry a bottle of silicone spray in my, in my What's gym the other reason? 
Yeah, you the other say reason one I don't reason. even mention it's not appropriate yeah. for, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but then and that way the drag remains the same. But I would always go wide. I think I have my clients do the same thing, and it's funny because you usually have to wait for somebody to do, who's doing some cable curl or some bullshit that they could be actually moving away. But anyway, I digress. Uh, I did want to point out this though: when it comes to back, because we were using chess as an, as an example. Your sequence will change, obviously, too, based not just on vulnerability or risk of injury, but it can change on, uh, especially when it comes to back training. Are you lat dominant or are you upper back dominant? And these days, I mean, I think you guys would agree. I don't think I've seen too many people, it happens, but the large majority of people are not lat dominant. And once you get that thickness through the upper back, we're actually fighting with this a little bit um, with Manny. He has, we need to bring his lat development up to match the thickness and the size through the upper back. And once you get that upper back thickness and strength, it's very difficult to actually, and, and I use the word isolate. We know we're not isolating, but for a term so we understand what we're doing to focus more and isolate on the lower on those lats i almost said lower lats but anyway i'm using labels that everybody understands. it's okay it's okay on I'll the say lats, lower it's lats difficult too. okay fair enough it's difficult to do that when you have it much like um you know hitting in uh, like upper chest or chest in general if you have very strong anterior delts uh, early on when guys are very, very strong, when I had a buddy in high school who was like this, he could not build his chest for shit and really struggle with it because his shoulders were so dominant. Yeah. In the ninth grade, he could you know, walk in and grab a, you know, 135 and start pressing it overhead. And he would do it just to be a dick. So the guys were like, uh, that kid's like 15 years old. What the fuck? But he had a paper thin chest. And I don't mean that shitty because if he heard me say that, he would be offended by it even at 52 years old. But it bothered him when he was young and it probably still bothers him to this day. The point is, is when you, th then that will change the sequence of exercises too. You know, with Manny, we're going to dig in. I'm actually going to go down there. He doesn't know yet, but I'm going to go down there and I'm going to work um, back sessions with him in Miami, if yeah. not once a week, once every couple weeks to really get him to, to force him to dig into and focus more. It doesn't mean that he doesn't know how to train back. That's sure. not the point. The guy's very smart and he trains very hard, but he's old school and he's moving weight and I need to slow him down. And we're going to open back sessions, at least every other back session with more isolative lat movements to really get in there and dig into the lats and then move on to other shit. Big right shit. Now. Right compound shit. That kind of gets to what I was kind of referring to about the the way you train a particular like muscle group, like because I think I feel like I'm more like Manny where I need I need to get away or I have gotten away from you know like okay you've seen someone do a dumbbell row where they're using excessive body English well to to say the least right where sure. the whole body's moving pretty much doing every day or, yeah. <laughs> yes right like. Yeah. So whereas like I've tried to make that exercise so, so hard on myself with like putting the front leg forward that and makes it so hard, trying man. to like makes it a lot harder, right? Because you're not able to open up with the hips and get that torso rotation. Yep. Um, I've tried to do like change my exercise selection away from exercises I would have done 10 years ago to what I would consider today more like pussy exercises or stretch and squeeze or, you know what I mean? Where I'm really slowing the rep down and I'm really trying to like track my elbow and I might look like I'm using the same weight as the high school kid that, you know, jumped off the machine before me, but I'm feeling it more in my lats. I'm feeling it more in my rhombites or where I'm, wherever I'm trying to feel it versus just moving dumbbell or barbell from point A to point B. Whereas right. like I would open up with like a chest exercise on like an incline Smith press and just bang up to like a heavy set of six to eight and be great with that and, and be able to progress with it. Whereas I'm not necessarily looking for strength progression in my back exercises. I'm looking more for, am I feeling that hitting the target tissue I'm really trying to hit? Yeah. Okay. So, so laid yeah. on us, what are, what's the rest of your, your say general philosophy then? My general philosophy? Yeah. As far as how would you Is, putting, putting workouts well, together? So again, like it comes back to like, I would program my chest differently than I program my back. So right. to give you an example, like we train back today and I'm on this kick right now where uh, we're starting every single workout off with pull-ups and I'm, and I do pull-ups with a band and I know people are like, Oh, you know, it looks pussy. You're taking the easy way out. No, I'm doing that. So I stay straight up and down. So my body's not going like this and I'm doing more of like a row than a pull-up. I'm doing a, str a true straight up and down pull-up. Mm -hmm. And when I feel like my feet are coming up like this, or I'm trying to cheat, the set's done. Even if I feel like I could get two more reps out of it. So I'm going to what I would consider positive failure. 
Um, and then from there, we moved on to a single arm pull down uh, on an angle. And again, like I was just mentioning, really tracking that elbow where I'm trying to drive that elbow into my hip. And if I feel like I'm coming out or I'm, um, or I'm just moving the handle, I, I stop the set. So I really want to feel every single, every single rep from the stretch all the way down to the contraction to where it almost feels like a knot in your lower lat. That's what, I, that's what we're working on. And then from there, um, we move on to rows. Uh, okay. I think we did a T-bar row today. That's, one, that's an exercise I try to progress on. Um, I really like a wide grip T-bar row. It's one of my favorites. I think, Skip, you hate mm -hmm. those, right? No, it's I love It's one them. of my favorites. Well, well, how wide are you talking? I mean, are you talking, you said wide, out, like outside of shoulder width. If it's outside of shoulder width, I think it's money. If it gets too wide, I, I'm not a big, I'm like super wide. But I don't uh, like just narrow uh, T-bars. I don't like narrow rows too much. It's not, I'm not a big yeah. fan. No, Range but I, I don't feel any other exercise in my Terry's more so than um, than like a wider grip T-bar row. And then from yeah. there, it's on to another machine row. This it, this is like one of the hardest machines. You put a plate on there and it feels like three or four plates on a different machine. I, it's hard to describe. I'll have to take a picture for you guys sometime. I can't remember the brand name. It's one of those things I've only seen in our gym and I think in Jim Mannion's gym down in um, hmm. Pittsburgh. But, you know, it's super, super heavy. It's it's it's. It's one of those, um, I'm trying to think of the term, like, you know, like there's feel good machines, like, like hammer strength machines where you can put five plates on each oh, side yeah. and oh, yeah. you know, you're really only a two plate bencher, but you got kids doing five yeah. plates on it. This is the opposite <laughs> of that. Like if you could row like five plates on a different machine, like that, that, that particular hammer machine that every, every gym has where you could load five or six plates on. Yeah. This one is like a one and a half plate type machine and it's super difficult. It locks right in. If you, if you drive your elbow just right, you can get right into that lat area. Nice. Um, and then we actually, and then I'll add in, um, we'll do something for lower back. And lately I've been on the kick of adding my least favorite exercise, RDLs in. And uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to back to those. I'm trying to progress on those again. So, And why do you put those at the end? Safety. Um, because I'm probably going to be weaker towards the end of the workout, right? Uh, but I'm also going to be locked in and focused. Like I'm going to know. A, like what is hurt, what has felt good today. So I'm going to know, A, is it even a good idea to do this exercise? Yeah. Because you know? if I'm walking around and my lower back is like, man, I'm just bent up to pick up my gym bag, I'm having trouble doing that. It makes no sense to go into an exercise that's going to be dominant on your lower back, right? Yeah, sure. So I like to save stuff like that for the end. And then also just, you know, who wants to walk around with a lower back pump while they're doing all the other stuff? <laughs> oh, yeah. You know what I mean? It's yeah, limiting. Exactly. You know, try to do a barbell row after yeah. that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, back in the day when I was in high school, you know, you, it's back day. You start off with a lap pull down, but then you go right to deadlifts. Right. And then after you get done deadlifts going up to whatever, then you do your barbell rows, which is like the stupidest, craziest thing in the world. And then you do your dumbbell I rows. I love so that you you're like saying that because so many people will open with and, it, and it's funny to me because and, and, and I'm not saying it's wrong. There really is nothing. There's nothing wrong if you have reason as to why you're doing it. But in my mind, I struggle with you're going to go to such a big exercise for back that causes all of the major muscles in the back to be stabilizers first. And, mm -hmm. and then you want to work them through a full range of motion. And you think that that's going to be maximal poundage or strength and contraction. It just seems so illogical to me to do it that way. But again, it's not right or wrong. It's just how my brain processes it. I would rather use much like you're doing with RDLs all the muscles of the of the back that you've already worked through a full range of motion then become stabilizers during the RDLs while you're then taking your lower back that has now been pretty damn warmed up throughout as far as blood flow and you might have already done I'm using the example but you know long pulley rows or something where your lower back has to your erectors have to stabilize and they're kind of warm to come into those heavier RDL weights where you're in more of a vulnerable position. I love that there's, and I'm not surprised, but I love that there's that logic in, and so this, I guess this is what I'm saying, or my point of bringing this topic up to the, you know, for the listeners is there isn't really any right or wrong. There's, there's the fact that you should be able to justify the yeah. sequence that you have your exercises. In. And if you can justify them, then, then there you go. That's great. If you can't, and it's just entirely random, look for the reasons and think more deeply into why you have the sequence you do, because you may be able to optimize that, that workout based on the sequence of the exercises better than you are. Hell yeah. 
I think that's a great way to wrap this topic up. Uh, plus, I want to want to move on because we get to hear some shit that I don't know about yet. Uh, Andrew, what's what's You're the deal, up, man? Scott. What's what's the deal? So so look, this is all I know, guys. Uh, I I text we you know we have like a group chat. Uh, Skip and Andrew and I uh, you know text, and uh, I was like, how was the weekend? He was like, terrible. It was really bad. And he's like, I'll tell you guys on Wednesday when we record. So that's all I know. <laughs> And I didn't get a lot of sleep last night because I knew that today you were going to tell me and uh, I've been distracted at work and now we're here. So let, what what happened? All right. So well, Why were you traveling, first of all? All right. No disrespect to anyone that lives in the state of Louisiana, particularly Shreveport. Okay. Uh-oh. Shout out to Shreveport. I'm sure you guys are great Start people. There. I'm sure you guys are nice people. <laughs> All right, so we booked a trip down to Shreveport for the Optimum Classic. Rachel, the wife, was going to do another bikini show. And uh, for those who don't know, she's a pro, so we were going down there to do another pro show. We thought uh, the New York Pro was going on the same weekend, so as was the, uh, I think it's called the Night of Champions in, in California. Yeah. So that's three pro shows in one day. So we're like, okay, was it Night the of talent Champions? is going to be split up. Is that what What's they that? call it now? Night of Champions? Because what didn't New York I know used to be uh, Night of Champions? Yes. Okay. Yes. I think it was called maybe the the amateur portion was called Night of Champions. Okay. Either way, it was out it was out in California. So yeah. we're like, okay, most of the West Coast talent's gonna be out there. Um, with the New York Pro going on at the same time, you're gonna get all the top Olympians over here. So we're gonna go down to Shreveport. Maybe we're gonna steal a few points. We're gonna yeah. move up the ladder a little bit. Because there was only one other girl that had beaten Rachel so far um, doing this show. And coincidentally, they had, they had done the uh, four show. Uh, this was their fourth show together this year. And she's been doing This girl good. ended up winning. Rachel, Rachel's been doing great. Rachel's been doing good. She she's made two first call outs. Yeah. We, we were right there. We, you know, we were listening to the feedback from the judges. Just come a little bit tighter in the glutes, which is exactly what we did. She was about a pound and a half lighter. Exactly what they had asked for. Yeah. So... We go to Shreveport and we're thinking, you know, we're not being cocky. Like, I don't want to make it sound like we're being cocky, but knowing what we had seen play out over the previous three contests, we were like, okay, I think we got a really good shot at, you know, moving up the ladder, maybe a second, maybe a third. We got third call outs. Um, Oh, like when when I'm sitting here and (laughs) I've never been so confused in my life, guys. Um, Like the only thing that was off was her tan, but um, it, it wasn't great. But like, we saw girls and no disrespect to masters competitors. Cause I'm a master's competitor. Right. And you know, skip you, both of you guys are masters competitors at this point. There were masters competitors that were getting fourth call outs at shows when she was getting first call outs just four weeks ago that were placed in the first and second call out. So like huh. that and girls that she was just beating that were in like third and fourth call outs, like they were placed in the first or second call out. And I just kept on listening to numbers get called. And like, it's just so disheartening when you're like, wait a minute, we're on the right track. We're on the right track. And then all of a sudden it, just stops you in your tracks. You who, know what I mean? Who was the yeah. head judge for this one? Uh, Gary Udit. Was Gary, was it Gary or Sandy at the other ones or? No. Uh, so we, we've been in front of Sandy. We've been in front of Joe Pashula. We've been in front of uh, uh, Trey, uh, Trey okay. Bennett. Yeah. Um, been in front of Steve, been in front of Tyler. So we've been in front of all the judges and, okay. you know, we put a little bit more stock into uh, Joe's feedback, um, Sandy's feedback, Steve, obviously, Tyler, obviously. I don't know what the heck happened to this show. I, I, I had messaged yeah. another judge after prejudging. I was like, hey, you know, what's going on here? Like, you just not like her today or what? He yeah. told me he had her in the first call out, but he's not the head judge. He has no idea what the hell is going on there. So, yeah. but anyway, that's that's the show. So the whole reason we went down there was like, oh, fuck. Like, <laughs> Which, plot, you know, plot foiled. You know what, too, I'll throw in is that I, I think sometimes people who don't know how things work at the pro level, like what we're talking about here is that, you know, there's going to be different judges at different shows And part of our strategies in bringing a client into a show like that is going to be because, you know, some of these people are going to want a slightly different look or at least historically, that's what it's thought. You know, Sandy wants this look versus, you know, Steve wants this look. And so, you know, you don't always hear that. So that aspect. So I think that's kind of interesting to share that with the audience, you know. Well, it's just weird when like. Two weeks ago and four weeks ago, you beat all these girls, and then all of a sudden you get relegated to like literally like the last call out when it's like, wait a minute, we yeah. were on a trajectory up here. We look better today. Like, I'm not taking anything from away from these girls, but yeah. I'm pretty good at analyzing bikini at this point. Were we going to win the show? Absolutely not. 
Okay. The girl that won absolutely deserved to win. Okay. In my mind, we should have been in that second, third, fourth place, at least for that comparison. Okay. But that's, mm-hmm. you know, that's another question about the show. You know, sure, sure. Part of that, obviously, I'm going to be a little bit biased, but I would be saying the same thing about any one of my clients based off the information I just gave you of like where we were going with the first couple shows of the year, our feedback, et cetera. But now let's get to the, 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 the real kick in the pants was <laughs> we get there. Yeah. We, we get there, right? Um, first off, the rental car had a kicked out um, fog light and a crack in the windshield, which huh. I, of course, documented, took pictures of, right? Uh, we're, we, we had to fly into Dallas because tickets were going to be twice the cost to fly directly to Shreveport. So we flew to Dallas yeah. two and a half hours away. We drove in. We get to the hotel and... It was nothing like what the pictures looked like, guys. Like we booked the hotel through Expedia. Maybe you could put some of those up now, Scott, because I like this one. Yeah, let's see if this kind of there we go. I like this one. That was the furniture upholstery, Ooh, guys. Okay. Yeah, do not okay. black light that co- that couch right there. Uh, don't, don't sit on that. that under we you don't have to. Our, you can see the stains without a black anything. light. We didn't sit on anything. We didn't put our stuff down. We literally walked in. We had to get a training session in before the gym closed. So we left our stuff there, went to the gym. While we're at the gym, we're figuring out where we're going to go because we're not staying on that place. You got to show some yeah. of the other pictures. You knew, just, you knew I it mean, was. Let me ask you. You looked at this front door. You knew that it was a problem yes. before you even walked yes. in, didn't you? This as is, soon oh, that's been that, hit with like, a battering ram several <laughs> times. Well, there was some shit absolutely. going on in there. The, the, the <laughs> inside guys, of the door is there were, too much better. There was like... There was like dead skin. Yeah, that's the inside. Okay. Oh my. There was like God. dead skin on the floor. There were fingernails. There was a ball of hair about this big. There was uh, the tissue container had zero tissues in it. Um, well, I mean, uh. there was some. There was some like yeah. <laughs> so I literally documented all this shit because I'm like, we're getting our money back. We're get we're getting out of this place. Yeah. Um. So anyway, so we had to get into another hotel. The other hotel had a bed that was maybe Ew. big enough for my dog. Yeah, that was the floor, guys. Okay, that was everywhere. Oh, I mean, my God. <laughs> like, absolutely disgusting. Show, show the bathroom. Do you see the bathroom? Let's see. There I was like some There was like know. some unidentified, probably shit on the floor. Okay. Oh. Yeah. Do you see that little Holy stuff crap. on the bottom left there? I don't know what the hell that was. Yeah. We didn't that, stick it. We didn't that even use that That toothbrush looks bad, too, over there in the corner. <laughs> they, who left their toothbrush? <laughs> Yeah. This was there. Oh no, that is not. That guys, was not there, guys. That, that could. Not- it was on the floor, right in front of there. It was on the floor, right in front of there. Okay, showing oh they did God. not do any here's vacuuming. The, here's right. the safe. There's a picture of the safe that was in the room right here. Oh no, that's not the safe, guys. That's, the safe. that's some vent. And that was exposed, and the air was blowing out of that, blowing that dust at us. Okay, you know somebody so, yeah. opened that safe up. Somebody or somebody opened that vent up because they went to hide shit in there. You know that's what it well, was. Well, no question. Right. There were drug, drugs or money in there, one or the other. Did you check? Because yeah, you might have found like a stack of bills in there. Yeah, dude, no, I shit. didn't want to get hepatitis. I didn't want to get hepatitis. Yeah. <laughs> like, there's no way. So we get to another place. The bed's oh, tiny. I didn't get any sleep. I got like three hours of sleep on that Thursday night, Friday night, leading to the show. Now the way we scheduled it, we had to leave Sunday morning at. Yeah, it looks like a classy joint. We had to leave Sunday morning. We had a flight at 6 o'clock out of Dallas. So the plan was we get done the show. We were going to get in the car at 9 o'clock, drive to Dallas, find something to eat, and then try to take a nap in the parking lot before we get on. Yeah, We hit a fucking rainstorm out of hell. Like The only way I can describe it is if someone took an Olympic-sized pool and just continued to like dump it <laughs> onto the road. And I don't know if this is common for down there. It was actually kind of amazing. Like we were going 15 miles an hour in the interstate for about yeah. an hour and a half. Yeah. It, it was crazy. And at times Rachel's like, you, got, you should pull over. You should pull over. I'm like, no, nah, like we're going, you know, it was like absolutely amazing. Uh, it started off with a heat, heat lightning that I don't know went on. It, it lit up the whole sky. It was crazy. But anyway, we get to the airport, we make it there in time, no nap, obviously. And just to find out that our flight um, got canceled and so oh, we're like man. we're like are you freaking kidding me we could have actually tried to get some sleep last night we were able to find another flight and get home later but we got home much later than we thought we would we'd like to get home sunday to be able to like go to the grocery sure you know get your week sit set up you know all that yeah get your week set up check in on emails if i have anything left over so yeah it was just kind of a a shit weekend and a waste of money. Wow. That sucks, man. That sucks. And, and I, oh. you know, I can, I can feel for you guys too. Cause you, you know, you took 
the critiques. You follow, but it just goes to show too. I mean, anybody watching that, you know, because uh, I, I I see so many times that people um, they want to get into bodybuilding and they're like, I want to, yeah, I want to win. That's my goal. I'm going to win this show, and yeah. you never freaking know. You know, you never know what's going to happen. Yeah. Right. Let me say, like, we're not delusional thinking that we're like, a, you know, top Olympian or that. Yeah. You know. Um, we were going to win the show. Like we have tons of respect for like the other competitors, especially the girl that won. Like we've seen her four times this year and she'd been right there. Second, third, second, third, you know, right up in the ranks. Yeah. And just where the trajectories, when you're in that call out with this, with some of these girls regularly. And then all of a sudden you're like way in the back of the bus. It's like, Whoa, whoa, whoa like, like we're not even yeah. off. Like what's going on here. You know, it's just one of yeah. those stumpers that uh, it's upsetting, but <clears throat> we got a bunch of listener questions. It's a head, it's a head scratcher for sure. Before we got to let me, can I add one thing? Yeah, I'm sorry, I I cut you off twice. I just want to add one thing. I want because I think this is important. The listeners, look, because we know better, and I'm sure that you understand this too, too, Andrew. So I just want to let the listeners know this: when there is something that doesn't go the right way, and it, it looks like someone was was robbed or screwed or like what the fuck happened, yeah, that's not on the competitors. So getting mad at another competitor for beating your client or beating your friend yeah. or beating your mom or something that yeah. doesn't have anything to do with them. And and I'm not saying, you know, the judges suck and blame the judge. All I'm saying is it's not the competitor's fault that yeah. they were placed where they were. Yeah. Sometimes it I said this about Manny earlier. Sometimes it grows your way. Sometimes it, it, it doesn't. It's a subjective sport. You're going to get your get a call that maybe you didn't deserve. You're going to not get a call. Maybe you deserve in your situation, it is a little bit different because it's just not even close. It's not like she went to second call out or it, it just really yeah. is a head scratcher. So if it happens to Andrew or it happens to his wife or it happens to a client of mine or whatever, or Scott, it, it happens more than you would think. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and it, it really. It's, but usually, it's, don't it's you think, Skip? Usually, when you see those little those little things like that, as coaches and people that have been around the sport, judging, watching, you can be like, okay, I can justify why they went that way, right? Yeah, like, sure. Like for yeah. instance, when you were breaking down to Manny, like, okay, why you got fifth instead of third or fourth? Yeah. You were. Mm -hmm. It was pretty easy for you to say, okay, I, I can understand why this judging panel went that way. Like they didn't exactly. put you in last place, right? Like, and you can't write. And, and you oaks. can't. And you can't like um, you can't expect that every judging panel, Scott. You touched on this earlier. Just because it's a different judging panel, there should be subtle differences. But when there is a huge contrast or a huge disparity, really, that shouldn't happen unless something really dramatic is is changed like the condition isn't there or someone is yeah. there's some weird shit going on it, even with those yeah. different head judges and things like that it should still be like you said the Similar. same trajectory it should be in this exactly it it most definitely should be i know i'd be i'd be a little frustrated too and at the same time it's one of those things it's like what are you going to do you go to the next show and you that's what we're doing good. we're going to miami next week good so, good yep all right, before we got into our questions, um, you had a shout out, uh, Andrew. So I want to make sure we got that in. And this was uh, yeah. to Ty Bender. So I think he's the guy in the middle here. Yep, that some... was his first show. He chose yeah. The Pit, which is traditionally nice. a very tough show. And he works with my buddy Morgan Rice, who if you oh, guys yeah. know him, he's like a no He's a no bullshit guy, right? He yeah. he actually does roster cuts um, on his clients. Really? But um. Yeah, like if he knows you're not like holding up, he's like, you're getting cut, like pink slip, end of the week, you know, stop paying me, that kind of thing. <laughs> wow. But um, but no, this kid came up and said hello and wanted a picture, and uh, we just chatted, and I and you know I gave him a lot of compliments because you know he's a young guy, he did the work, he came in looking great, and yeah. I think he's taking the right steps, you know. Um, I think he got second in I think all of his classes, but I could see him in two years being a show winner, <clears throat> so. That's a lot of uh, a lot of development for uh, how old did you say he's pretty young, right? Younger I want to say he's like 21, 21, 22, something like that. But Hell yeah, yeah, just just big, big props to him. And thank you for listening to the program, buddy. Oh, yeah. All right. I'm not sure if I got all my screen caps in order here, but I do have a bunch of questions that I kind of gathered up um, from previous episodes. Uh, let's see what we got here. We got another training. We'll start with this one. Training question. Um, Noel. New York City. I'd love to hear about the fine line between number of reps. For instance, obviously a certain amount of volume via reps is required to stimulate muscle. However, when the poundages go up and intensity increases, plus the addition of intensity techniques, I find it very hard to count past 20 reps. 
if one is able to do 30 reps or more, wouldn't it be more optimal to increase the weight so muscle failure is reached at approximately 20 reps? Seems like going over is almost junk volume. If one can push through to do 50 reps, the pain and suffering will be intense, but wouldn't there be more benefit via hypertrophy doing more weight with uh, 20 to 25 reps, law of diminishing returns? Does that come into play, guys? I can step up and say I did 50 reps last week after John was on for legs. And my situation Dusty. is a little bit different because I'm a little bit limited. I'm sorry. Thank you. Yeah, good point. You did 50? Uh, it was running. Yeah, but I, well, I did like, I, it was fucked up. It was brutal. I didn't want to get into it. But anyway, I'm, I'm a little bit limited be, uh, with my knee right now. So it, I figured, you know what? I'm going to find out two things. I'm going to find out if it's uh, if repetition irritates it or if it's just resistance of weight. Because I figured if I did 50 reps and it was lighter and it irritated my knee, that's pretty good to know that it may actually be repetition instead of what, instead of just resistance. But anyway, um, I'll tell you this. And, and, and I would use the example of a cyclist. If you see a cyclist, rarely will they not have pretty ridiculous quads. So... If it's high rep, constant, there's obviously hypertrophy from that high rep, high volume training. The question I think becomes which is better, and and all I can say is the this is my take on it, my opinion on it. Um, the body doesn't know a rep range; it knows a stimulus. So you're either going to create a stimulus that it's that it hasn't seen or that it's not used to, and there'll be adaptation, which is essentially hypertrophy, or there won't. So the 50 rep set to me crippled me. Does soreness necessarily mean growth? It's not married. It's an argue, you know, argument of correlation versus causation. But at the same time, it's a pretty safe bet that if you're crippled sore when I hadn't been before, that that is a, a stimulus that the that my legs and my quads were not used to. And I would have, I came out of that session going, there's no fucking way I did not grow from this. And it was 50 reps a second and to, to, I don't want to say failure, but about as fucking when I was at thir uh, 35, 38, I'm like, fuck my life. Like, I don't think I'm going to get there. And then it becomes a mental issue. Second one, I only got to 40. So there was an element of failure there. And then I went to pendulum and I did something very similar. So the point is, is I do think that there is merit in the higher reps. I will say this though, to hit, cause I'm, you know, my brain immediately goes to, well, fuck it. I'm doing it next week and I'm going to do it the week after that's not how it works because it's a it's mm. essentially a high intensity technique that the body will adapt to relatively quickly sure but i do like the higher sets in my situation because i did find that the repetition didn't irritate it it is a resistance issue for my cartilage knee problem so i'm going to benefit from it quite a bit i'm actually pretty happy that that topic came up and it gave me a different different thing to use for training but i think there is huge benefit in that technique uh, even going to, I mean, it's it's kind of brutal, but the 100 rep um, thing too, where maybe you only get to 78, but you drop set, or not drop set, I'm sorry, rest pause, you know, the rest of the way to 100 rep. It's brutal shit. It's just brutal fucking shit. Hmm. Getting back to your point about uh, adapting to the stimulus, would you agree that like it's one of those things that you can use once in a while, but it's not something you should program in every single week? Yeah, I, absolutely. And that's why I'm, I'm glad that I touched on that just because I don't want anybody to think that, yeah, this is a way that I would train for, you know, three or four months and expect continued progress out of. I, I don't think that would be the case either. But I'd use the example of the cyclist because I do think mm -hmm. that the higher volume, if you did, I mean, look, there are some people I know I grew. I just use myself as an example back in the D.C. days. I grew from those 20 rep sets to failure really more than I had ever grown on heavier squats or heavier movements at eight to 10 or 12 reps. It could be that I was taking, you know, it could be argued that I took those eight, 10, 12 rep sets further and closer to failure and was pushing them closer to the 20 rep thing. So then it becomes a, an issue of failure more than anything. There's, this is a huge, the rep range is tough, the debate and the argument, because I still think it's effort more than it is an act. And there's time under tension, there's a lot of other variables than just just banging out. You know, you get three. It was my my biggest concern about DC training was if you get three more reps, 
but you made the tempo of those reps a little bit quicker without really consciously being aware of it, then was there really progression? But mm -hmm. the system, the way he set it up is to make the progression measurable in a black and white sample. So you're going to have those slightly changing variables sometimes. And the point yeah. is you're still progressing. It's measurable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. We've got one from, um, I'm going to go to the live feed here real quick. Jojo, he joins us and says, um, what is the bare minimum amount of protein intake and still grow muscle? He says an example being if someone uh, has kidney issues. The bare minimum. I don't think we can throw out a number, and especially if he has kidneys issues, yeah. and we, we probably shouldn't be throwing out a number at him. But yeah. <laughs> I, I don't think there's the, a. I don't think there's an exact number. B. I don't think there's an exact number that we could give a blanket for a man who weighs two fifty versus a man who weighs two hundred or, or anything like that. I, I, I'm thinking back to the podcast you did with uh, Dr. Scott recently, where he talks about um, protein, oh, protein in particular, yeah. and yeah, your minimum protein requirements, and then you know how all the additional protein you eat. Um, well, well, protein being the number one macronutrient that you can eat that will not put on fat. Yeah. So essentially in a way, a lot of us might be just completely overeating protein, but you know, because it's bodybuilding, we're going to make sure we do everything we can take it to the nth degree. Um, you know, and, and I think back to like, you know, I seen some of, um, Chad Nichols diets where it's like seven meals a day, 12 ounces of protein, every single meal, whether it's 12 ounces of chicken, 12 ounces of steak. Me personally, I know I couldn't handle that digestion wise. I just, you know, it's a lot. Way hell. Um, you know, I know for me, I think if I'm getting about 300 grams of protein a day, I'm going to be growing. Uh, that's probably my minimum. I get more than that, but I think 300, maybe even a little bit less. Um, you know, but I also say that seeing John Meadows continue to progress eating probably, maybe 140 grams of protein a day yeah. like when you add it all yeah. up yeah i mean two eggs for breakfast right a protein drink before you one scoop of protein powder before he goes to the gym um you know four or five ounces of fish after the gym and then maybe a chicken breast meal later on that night with six ounces what's that that's under 200 grams easily and he was you know yeah. 220 pounds in shape pretty much year round so <laughs> I started working with a guy recently. Um, he fills out the questionnaire, um, pays me. We're getting started. And, um, you know, and in the questionnaire, I say, you know, do you have any health concerns? And, you know, at the end, I even put, is there anything else we haven't discussed that would be important I should know? It doesn't put anything. Shout out to you, Matt, if you're watching. And then oh, I mean, is that him? his name is Matt. He's a different man. Oh. He, uh, he, um, sure, yeah. and he's doing a really good job, <laughs> by the way. But I get the plan set up, and he mentions, yeah, um, I should be seeing my doctor at the end of the month for my kidney disease. I was like, wait, what? <laughs> hold on, hold yeah, on. Yeah, for Hold on, we just built a plan. I'm all set. Like I'm ready to hand it over to you. We're gonna get started. <laughs> what? So I, I so we we backed up, you know, and I talked to him. And um, he told me how, how much, I think he said he was using, I can't remember what it was, if it was like 300 grams of protein or something, he built up to that. And he went to his doctor and the doctor said, hey, uh, you gotta back off from that a little bit. So I think he went down to like 200. So I can't remember what it was, what the numbers were. It's been you know, a couple months since we had that discussion. But anyway, what I ended up coming, what I ended up, coming up with is uh, a plan that was very low in protein. I'm looking at it right now. So we have, 135 grams of complete protein in his diet to start 135 grams uh, 166 grams of total protein so in in one thing i think people don't always understand is you know the proteins we can use versus you know the, like the extraneous protein in your in your oatmeal that might not be beneficial yeah. for growing muscle or you know in your broccoli so i went through and figured all that out and this was a little bit under what he had been using what he was comfortable with using um, and then my thought is, is that if his body is tested out okay with that amount, let's see what we can do. Because flat out, he's not a big guy, right? And I think muscle mass is probably going to be a factor, right? So if JoJo is a big dude, he's probably going to need more protein than Matt is. But if you're not a big dude, you know, the thought is, is we're starting low. And he's going in to get tested by his doctor again. I'm going to see where he's at. And maybe down, and he's losing fat really well. He looks like he's, you know, retaining muscle. He's getting stronger. All the signs are saying that things are going good, right? 
But, uh, you know, we'll see what the lab work says. And then maybe down the road, we may need to increase protein. In, in, and I think we probably have some room, you know what I'm saying, at 166 yeah. grams. But uh, that would be my thought would be, you know, work close with a doctor if you have issues. Yeah. And the reality is you might not be able to be a guy who's going to be pushing 300 grams, 400 grams of protein. You know what I mean? Yeah. No. Might just not be in the car. Dis- disclaimer also for anybody that's looking to hire a coach. If you have kidney disease or any issues, make sure you let them know. That's as yeah. a bodybuilding coach, when I see kidney issues, that's big red flags in my head. Like, we're going to really talk about this, right? Like, yeah. you yeah. know, like joint injuries or, you know, I don't know, maybe they're on Accutane. So, like, liver is going to be a little messed up. But I see kidney issues and I'm like, okay, we need to really figure out, you know, are you, what's your EGFR? Are you stage three failure? Like, what's going on there? Let's, let's get this figured out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. yeah. And, and, you know, and that's, that's what we did in this situation. And to his defense, he didn't know that, that with bodybuilding, we might be pushing protein. So, uh, you know, I'm glad it worked out the way that it did. I think some people do know, though, and they may have the idea, well, you know, so-and-so may not work with me. Oh, and and yeah. I don't think – I think people should know it's not necessarily a disqualifying issue. You have a low EGFR or you have other you know issues, whether it be kidney or anything else. But it needs to be taken into consideration – so that you know when the plan is put together you know we we know a lot of shit and we've got a lot of experience working with a lot of people with a lot of different issues so even though it's possible that so a coach could actually say you know i'm not comfortable with this i think it's far more likely that they'll just take that into consideration they're going to ask you a lot more information make sure they have a lot of background and they'll be able to work the plan around that and just to be clear because i mean he was asking for kind of specifics and i agree with you andrew you can't really give specifics on how low to go but i would say this I think that without the without existing kidney issues, because other than knowing he had kidney issues, I don't know the specifics of what it is. I don't like to drop below. I, I would say a, an, a gram of protein per pound of body weight, but I tend to go with lean mass because I yep. don't really care to feed protein to you know someone who's fifty pounds overweight. Uh, and at the same time, Scott, coming back to what you said, I just want to make this point: you don't count. Um, I, I, you didn't say incomplete, pro, but I think that's what yeah, you meant. I don't count protein. incomplete protein either from, you know, peanuts or, or, uh, you know, oats or things like that. I just have never done that. And it was funny because I still every now and then will get someone who will work with me and say, well, you know, the calories count. Why don't, and it's funny because I think Justin Harris, uh, you know, troponin nutrition, him and I go back to 2001 on an anabolics, um, forum, anabolics EX at the end uh very old school form 2001 and it's funny because I, and I don't know if he still does it but i know right up until four or five years ago he and i still had that same approach where we don't count trace macros and not just protein but trace amounts of carbs and peanuts and things like that either and sometimes i'll get a client one out of 15 that i have to explain the process to and why it does and, and I'm not saying that everybody does that. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. It's just it's the system that I have used and it's solid because I've used it for twenty years and and someone like Justin who's who's old school. Maybe the newer school guys don't do that. Maybe it's just something that Justin and well, I and people like us have been around a long I'll time tell you why. on to. I'll tell you why, because everyone today has like those trackers, like the My Fitness Pal yeah. and because exactly. like even when client I'll have clients that they have a concrete plan written out, right? And they're like, Well, yeah, they'll they'll say something in reference to their My Fitness Pal. And I'm like, My fit- why are you putting the plan I wrote for you into my fitness pal? Like you have your plan written, time. you know, yeah. six I ounces of chicken, yeah. two hundred grams of rice. Like that's what you're supposed to be following. Don't please don't put it in right. there. Like because then they'll send screenshots back to me sometimes. I'm like, look. I'm not being disrespectful. I'm not even going to look at that. You know, same yeah. thing with like, uh, like DEXA scans or not DEXA, but like those in body scans, people will send those to me. I'm like, look, that's, yeah. I'm like, look, that's cute and everything. I don't look at that. I know what my eyes see. <laughs> right. and I know what you need to look like on stage. I don't care if it says you're 7.8%. You're not lean enough yet. Like, you know what I mean? Right. Like I'll trust my eyes over, you know, mechanical data any, any day of the week. Sure. Um, mm-hmm. But I was going to say this about the incomplete proteins because um, cause I, I do the same gen- general thing you guys do. Like I really only count the regular protein, but I do put everything down like the five grams of protein in a you know, cup of oats, half cup of oats or whatever. Just for that reason, because people are always repeating back to me, oh, it doesn't add up, et cetera. But I do think that the incomplete proteins, because, you know, the way protein works, right? You eat a protein, 
you, you, uh, your body digests it. It goes into the amino acid pool. It's not like mm-hmm. that gram of chicken surplants itself into a gram of protein on your biceps, right? It's all sure. broken down into amino acids and then your body reconfigures it based off mTOR and all the other signals, et cetera. So I do think that some of those amino acids, um, you know, what being incomplete, it's all about, does your body have the right combination of them at the right time when your body is making proteins? And sure. let's say you're eating chicken breast and chicken breast is higher in histidine and maybe some of the other amino acids that aren't considered essential. Your body can pull from some of those other places. Maybe, maybe you have an excess of some amino acids in the chicken breast. Your body can pull. You see where I'm going with this? Like with yeah, yeah. the incomplete proteins sure. to eventually make a complete protein. But I still agree with you guys with the system. Like I, in my head, I'm adding the six ounces of chicken. I'm adding the six ounces of steak. I'm adding the two scoops away. I'm not sitting there micro five grams of protein right. from from the oats. You're or, not counting you know, out the one gram of. No, like I'm, I'm counting for the caloric sense of just to keep a rough tally so that they don't come back to me and say this doesn't <laughs> add up. But yeah, yeah. yeah. So all right, here's a fun one. From Lucas, he says, um, off topic, when doing grocery shopping, what is the first thing you go for? Uh, we'll stop right there because he had a second one, too. I think it matters. It determines, like, which grocery store I'm going into because, like, if you go into the grocery store, most of them, at least up here, enters you right into the produce section. So I kind of just go produce, fruits, meats and fishes, and then around the store to, like, the eggs and then if we need anything in between, I go in between. But, but you know what I mean? Like, it's for me, it's it's not like I walk into the store and be like, oh, I got to get this first. I walk into the store and, oh, my produce and my veggies are right in front of me. I'll, I'll grab those now because they're in proximity. Yeah. Yeah, I'm similar. I'd almost, and I'm not picking on <clears throat> Lucas for this question, but a better question would be why does this, why do the same stores in a grocery store chain Why are they set up differently? Why is the produce and the dairy in different places in different Safeways? It's a fucking Safeway. Just put them in the same spot. So when you go to a different one, Whole Foods the same damn way. I go into a different one. I got to try to find where the fuck is my meat? Why have they set up this one? Yeah, but I'm I I do something similar. I think my only thing is it's funny that you say different different uh stores because you know i go to one i go to whole foods for specific things and i have to go to target for other shit um and i will not go to this Publix down here because it's downtown let's just say it's it's i am a pretentious dick and it's low brow i'm just gonna say it it's fucking low i like public i like Publix. i do too i do too this one specifically though because Uh, it's downtown it's very very small and very limited when you only have and i don't go there for ben and jerry specifically but when you don't have ben and jerry's other than the little trial size and it's in one fucking flavor cherry garcia i'm going somewhere else it's not shopping the trash a good selection yeah, trash. trash. That's what I said too. Anyway, uh, I go for my chicken first because I go in and I tell him I need 10, 12 pounds because I cook it for the week while he's doing that. And it's the same guy all the time. So if my daughter goes in, she'll ask, you know, it'd be like, oh, you know, we kind of know him. Same with my wife. Uh, so then I go around and I get my other shit and then I come back to and get my meat. So I always go for chicken. I go get groceries based on the fact that I need my protein source for the week. Otherwise, I'm not going to the fucking grocery store. We, uh, I, you know, I have to thank Victoria, uh, for being in my life because now we, um, we write everything down on, on a, uh, whiteboard on the refrigerator. So we have like an Italia list and then we go together a lot of times and she'll snap a picture of it. So that way we stay organized. Otherwise it's all in my head. I never did grocery lists before that. And I was pretty good because I was only buying like seven different things. And before the pandemic, I'd go to the grocery store every damn day to get two items after I trained. It was my vacation. Uh, from from like getting out of the house and all that go to the gym go to the grocery store go home uh it still is kind of like semi-vacation we have meyer here it's called a lot of people call it meyers with an s but it, there's no Meyer thrifty acres yeah yes exactly you know it skip so we go to meyers as you call it here and there's the clothing department and uh they have everything else uh, all your pharmacy stuff um lawn care into like then like hunting and sporting goods and and that's all on one side of the store the other side of the store is a grocery area so my um 
my what's 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 the word I'm looking for here? Like when you're my, when you've got your game. My game plan is that we park on that side with all the home goods oh, stuff. Yeah. There's less people parked there, so we can yeah. park. You know, there's not a lot of carts and people banging around and everything. And then we go in that side, get anything we need from like you know hair stuff or whatever, and vitamins. And then we just casually stroll. We walk through the like home goods areas and look at the lawn care stuff. And it's, and then we finally make it back toward the actual food. Now we can start from the back and work our way forward. So we don't have to, you know, and then because Victoria has a list, we're very efficient. We hit that aisle and we're like, oh, yeah, we need, you know, coconut oil cooking spray or, you know, stevia or whatever. That's the point. Tell you guys are newly married. Because yeah, I was just going to say. I'll- I'll tell my wife, I'm like, hey, I'm going to go to the grocery store. You want to go? She's like, fuck no, I don't want to go. I'm going to sit here on my I'm like, what are you going to do? I'm going to sit here on my phone and I'm going to watch <laughs> Blade <laughs> Empire. Like, what? Like, we don't do things like that anymore. It has okay. to be very, very fun for her to get Or even worse. We, we'll, we'll stop at the grocery store on the way home. And, like, she's telling me all the stuff we need on the way. And then, like, I start to turn on the car. She's like, no, no, don't turn it off. I'm like, I'm oh, staying I'm going in. in. She's, like, <laughs> she's already on her phone. She's rolling. Yes. And I'm like, Yes. Which works out because honestly, you know, us as coaches, we're so damn sedentary that I actually do like going to the grocery store for the steps aspect of it. Yeah, to get my steps yeah. up every day. <laughs> yeah. So I purposely park, park farther away, um, even then, so I can walk in and then I kind of walk the aisles even when I don't need to just to get my steps up towards the end of the day. So I don't have to take a walk at night. So we don't, yeah, we here's the thing is like we don't do, we don't go out to do fun stuff. Like this to us yeah. is that is our fun, Skip. That is yeah. our fun. Yeah. We're, we're looking to see what uh, what lawn chairs they have now for you know spring or whatever. That's like yeah, you, you, you know there's an app uh, Scott that connects the two of you that uh, it's like grocery list or something where Ooh. you put everything down and then like if she checks in when she's like driving off you know driving out and about and she needs to stop at the grocery store she can look and see oh Scott put down that we needed oatmeal we need this and like then she can hit the button and it chalks it off the list for you so that when you go you're like oh we need cleaning supplies well I'm in Walmart I can pick those up. So just kind of like it's like a running list. You guys have to understand, though, we're both here 24 hours a day. We don't leave. Yeah, the house. like we if we yeah. leave, it's like you want to do a big adventure yeah. today. Let's go to a different grocery store, you know, yeah. <laughs> and try to find the produce department. Yay! Yeah. All right. Well, listen, we got to wrap this thing up. We actually went a little bit long. Uh, I appreciate everybody hanging with us, guys. If you want to reach out to any of us for coaching, we'd be happy to talk to you. You can go to teamskip.com. You can go to bodyberry.com. That's with a, a B E R R Y, not an A. Uh, you can reach out to me, McNally Diets at Gmail. Not excuse me, McNally Diets at Gmail dot com. Hit up our great sponsors, TrueNutrition.com. Use our code THINK if you're in Canada, SupplementSource.ca. And check out our Patreon if you're not a part of that. Like I said, I've been putting out some additional little bonus features over there. Thanks a lot, guys, and we'll see you soon.